Hello folks and welcome back. This is a lecture on chapter five, which is creating effective business messages. And I thought to set the tone here and have a little fun, I would uh, I show you a brief clip from the office of a very ineffective uh, business message as created by Michael Scott. Uh, so if you haven't seen that yet, it's only a minute and a half or so long. Go take a look at it, come back, and uh, I'll refer to that little clip uh, throughout this uh, video. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, let's get into it. Let's take a look here at the uh, five learning objectives for this chapter. We're talking about the goals of effective business messages and the process for creating them. Uh, how to identify the needs of the audience as part of the AIM planning process or audience, uh, audience analysis, information gathering, and message development. I'll uh, be talking about how to gather the right information and the right business ideas in that process. Uh, developing your primary message and the key points in, uh, again, as part of this process. And then finally, how to explain and apply positive and other oriented tone, in, in other oriented tone, <laughs> rather, in business messages. Uh, so uh, just looking at these objectives, thinking about the uh, what would an effective business message look like? Uh, how would you go about creating that? Uh, what does the audience need to hear? Uh, what information should you have uh, assembled to make a compelling case? And then how do you organize all this? What are the, the primary message, the key points? And then uh, how do you uh, maintain a positive tone? So keeping these objectives in mind before we really talk about any of it, I want you to go back, look at the clip uh, from the office again, and think about where that went wrong. Uh, which one of these uh, learning objectives uh, would Michael have benefited the most from? Or maybe he needs them all. Uh, just consider that for a moment, and then we'll continue. All right, and this is the overview of the chapter. We'll start by talking about the goals of an effective business message. Let's we'll, uh, talk about this AIM planning process. It's a very handy acronym. Uh, again, audience analysis, information gathering, and uh, message development. Audience needs, business ideas, and the key points. I really like the way this author sets up uh, the structure using uh, flow charts. Very handy. Uh, and then more about this positive tone business, which is might, <laughs> might actually be the most critical thing of all. You know, how do you strike just the right balance between that uh, level of enthusiasm and positivity uh, without going overboard and just sounding uh, <laughs> you know, hyperbolic <laughs> or it's just silly, uh, you know, making a mockery of yourself. Uh, but it's really a, a key point. It's hard to find just that exact balance. So here's uh, the process for creating business messages, uh, one of three. Uh, main thing to think about is this is a process. Uh, so you don't just sit down write an effective business message, bada boom, bada bing, and sin. Uh, there's actually quite a bit that goes on before and after. And we'll look at some uh, some charts. Hopefully they'll be in this PowerPoint. Uh, but the book gives them, gives them to you, and you can see that the writing is actually a small, small uh, slice in the middle in between the planning and the revising. Uh, but anyway, this process will involve examining uh, the ideas, developing and refining those ideas in a way that provides business value to the audience. So already here thinking about what is that audience value? Just because you're interested in something uh, doesn't mean that the audience will find it interesting or useful. And so just trying to adopt that mindset <laughs> from the outset is helpful. And this will drive collaboration and productivity in your work relationships. And this is again a really key point. Uh, again, you won't be writing many uh, business documents or reports just by yourself. <laughs> once you leave college. <laughs> you know, you'll almost always be part of a committee or a group uh, or a whole agency or company. And there'll be a lot of uh, other, uh, you know, hands on the uh, hands on the wheel, so to speak. This is just why the, the planning is so important and the revising. Uh, the actual writing is, is fairly minimal. So here's a little diagram showing us the process for creating a business message. That shouldn't be very new to you. Of course, you want to plan, you want to write, and then review. And if you've taught writing, then you know this is uh, where students tend to mess up, is they don't think of these things as being balanced. Or maybe just they think of a little bit of planning, jump right into the writing, and then just skip the review process altogether. Uh, just wait and just, just hand something in and see what grade they get. Now, this is a very unfortunate habit. 
uh, that I think colleges actually sort of ingrain this habit and they reward this habit more than you'd think. Uh, you really have to break yourself from that uh, this habit. And you need <laughs> forget about it. Uh, you want to be thinking about spending as much time planning as you would writing or reviewing, and the same thing with uh, reviewing. And here's a nice uh, set of triangles. <laughs> Speaking of pyramid schemes, <laughs> the stages and goals of effective uh, message creation. Uh, so let's take a look here at the way they've got this uh, laid out. And so the planning is broken into some different stages, uh, thinking about the audience. And you'd be surprised how often the author of a document, even in this planning stage, they're not really thinking about, well, who's, who's actually going to be reading this? Uh, who is this audience? I see teachers do this all the time. Uh, they will write, uh, say, a syllabus or instructions for an assignment, and it sounds like they're talking to uh, a colleague. I mean, they'll be using lots of technical language, <laughs> lots of jargon, very complex sentences, and it's pretty clear they're not really thinking about the, their audience, which in that case is students who may not know uh, what half those words mean. That's uh, so just an easy example of that. Uh, gathering the right information. So notice it's not just gathering information, uh, but gathering the right information, again, for that audience. And then developing the message. Again, what is the message? And this will be, you'll be thinking about the audience and uh, the information you have to present. Uh, so that's this, the first stage, planning. Getting the content right, or what it is you want to write or say. And then the writing, getting the delivery right. And this term delivery just comes back to classical rhetoric, the idea of giving the speech, everything from hand gestures to the sound of your voice, the volume, the, the level of energy, etc. Uh, here we have it divided into, uh, again, three um, triangles within triangles. Uh, I think this, this author loves his triangles. Uh, the tone, the style, you know, word choices, level of formality, etc. And then the design of the document, the navigational design, uh, basically uh, the way you organize it and lay it out. And then finally, the review stage. This is where we'll get, be getting feedback. Again, a critical thing. Uh, again, in school, unfortunately, you usually don't get feedback until it's uh, the teacher. <laughs> Outside of college, uh, you want to get as much feedback, whether it's just showing your colleague something. Uh, running it by a manager, uh, or if you're in school, you might go to the right place, for example, to get feedback, but it's uh, essential. You don't want to distrust your own opinion of whether a document is acceptable. Uh, you want to get other eyes on that document. Uh, we'll be asking ourselves if the message is fair. Uh, and again, this could com come back to what we were talking about with the groups. You know, have you represented the, the group? And then finally, the <laughs> proofreading step, uh, so vital. Uh, so important. Uh, so many headaches could be saved if you just uh, would take the time to proofread. And you want to think the more important the document, the more uh, time you want to proofread. And you don't want to just proofread it yourself, but have other people look at it. It just so happens at the moment I am in the stages of uh, proofreading a book I've been working on for <laughs> well over a year now. And we're at the proofreading stage. Uh, so the uh, uh, this is all being done from, from India. Uh, so this company's in India, but they, uh, I guess, <laughs> outsource or insource their proofreader, uh, who I believe is uh, uh, maybe from America or the UK. Uh, but anyway, she's looking at this and she's finding, uh, she makes comments and corrections. And then I go back in and review uh, the comments and suggestions that she's made. And often uh, there's a lot more proofreading that I'm doing, finding basically I'm proofreading the proofreader and uh, vice versa throughout this stage. So uh, you'd be amazed how much of that goes into uh, books and articles, but even uh, a document like a resume, I should be very carefully proofread. And again, I looked at it, I didn't see those errors. She's finding things I didn't see and vice versa. All right, the process for creating business messages three of three. Uh, so expert writers are more likely to analyze the needs of the audience, yes, uh, generate the best ideas to tackle the problem and identify the primary message and key points before starting the formal draft of a business message. Of course, the implication there is that the amateurs uh, will just jump right into writing that formal draft. They won't spend nearly enough time 
in this planning phase. Oh yes, here's that. Here's this the diagram I was telling you about earlier. And so if we look at this, you can see uh, the poor writers. There's a little bit of planning, just you know, maybe a little brainstorming, and then they just do the draft. And notice what's missing. There's no reviewing whatsoever happening there. Uh, I get the. I just got an email from a student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I could tell they just they were kind of emotionally they probably got emotionally hijacked uh, they fired off this email to me it had completely the wrong tone it sounded very hostile very dismissive of the class and they were basically asking uh, uh, if they needed to buy uh, the the textbook for the class or the the access to uh, you know the the, the connect uh, but I could tell it was and the student really doesn't need to be trying to get out of <laughs> any activities. <laughs> you know, they, uh, this student in particular needs uh, practice uh, with, the develop, uh, with composing basically a business message. I mean, I would say a lot of, in a lot of ways a message from student to professors like a business message should follow these, these guidelines. Uh, but if he had thought a little bit more about it, uh, he could have saved himself a lot of pain. Uh, or at least a lot of uh, a lot of he saved me from getting frustrated with him, which I'm sure wasn't his goal uh, when he wrote that. Maybe he didn't even really know what his goal was uh, for sending that uh, message. Uh, so just an example here. I mean, that's I don't blame uh, the person, <laughs> their students, because <laughs> it's my job to help people like this uh, to become better writers and uh, basically quit firing firing off uh, sort of off the cuff emails. Uh, to people that you know could have a could have a hand in their destiny, <laughs> you know. So especially if you're writing to a supervisor or manager, uh, somebody like this, you really cannot, you know. I can't emphasize this enough of getting away from this model towards something uh, approaching this this excellent writers. But just to continue this, uh, if we look at the average writers, you can see there's a little bit of planning there, a little bit of thought about an audience, key points, etc lots and lots of time drafting now this it takes so much longer and if you look over here you can see it, it actually is a longer bar because the inadequate planning means there's a lot of trial and error a lot of back and forth a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, recursiveness maybe at some point they say wow i have to delete all this <laughs> it's inappropriate for the audience <laughs> or i don't have a key bit of information uh, now I do, I realize I have to go back and, and, and change all this. Uh, so this is why this is so protracted here. Uh, there's a little bit of reviewing, uh, but really not enough. There's probably still going to be many errors uh, that are left in the document at that point. Now look at the excellent writers, though. I mean, here we have the bulk. The bulk of the process is just spent planning. So before anybody starts talking about a formal document, formal report, getting to that stage, they're just planning everything out, you know, really putting some thought in all those categories. Relatively short drafting uh, cycle, and then about as much time reviewing as drafting. So take a look there. So you could say if, it, if they worked on the draft for a week, they spent a week reviewing. If they worked on this for a month, they spent a month reviewing. Uh, that's the key there and I think these are really good parameters to keep in mind uh, it's how the <laughs> I, I'm absolutely a hundred percent in agreement uh, with this author uh, and these uh, portrayals here all right so let's take a look at some of these stages in a closer view uh, so we said the most important stage of creating effective business messages is in the planning process and we'll be talking about this aim uh, planning process uh, unleashes your best thinking allows you to to, uh, to deliver in influential messages okay so let's uh, look at the first item here from aim then uh, which is the audience that's the a audience analysis so we want to think about the needs priorities and the values of who's ever in that audience so remember it's not a lot of uh, these uh, what do they call them uh, uh, beginning writers or novice writers, amateur, whatever. Uh, <laughs> they, they think about themselves as the audience only. Uh, they won't ever put themselves in the shoes of the people that, are be, that will be reading uh, their work or listening uh, to what it is they're, they're happy to say. They're kind of completely stuck in their own head, completely self-centered. They're unable to think about the other person. 
or unwilling to. Uh, you know, in the other books, they talk about a you-centric or an I-centric view of the world. And you really have to get beyond that, of course, to be an effective communicator. Uh, really, you, the better you get at this, the more you realize that, you know, the stuff that's going on with you inside your head is a lot less important for communication than really thinking about the, the other person. And that's what's really key. Uh, so they envision how the readers will respond when getting the message. So you can read this. You can look at your resume and think not just, well, is this spelled correctly? Or do, do I do a good job describing uh, my accomplishments? You know, that sort of thing. But really thinking about how would, you know, I, I want to imagine myself as the hiring uh, personnel, the, the hiring director, the HR expert, or whoever it is. Or with the student, I want to imagine myself as the professor getting this message. How will the professor uh, think about what I've written? How will they feel about it? And then uh, what action do I want this person to perform? What would it take to move me, you know, once I switch over to that other role? So the audience analysis, identifying the reader's benefits and constraints. So obviously, uh, you know, coming back to the student example here, what what are the benefits uh, to me? There really weren't any. I just kind of was complaining. Uh, the constraints, uh, I can't just say uh, to the student, no, you don't have to buy the, the product, <laughs> or I'm not in a position to give the, the person the product for free. Uh, I have uh, completely constrained, so that was, you know, sort of a, <laughs> that should have been a reason not to even send the thing. Uh, consider the reader values and priorities. Again, something the student did not do. Uh, you know, what are my values and priorities is to get as much, you know, to, to figure out what you need to learn uh, in this class and <laughs> do whatever I can. My top priority is to make sure you learn the information, retain the information, get as much practice with it as you can, because uh, I do value the uh, education. Now, it is true, I do also value uh, your you know, your well-being. I don't want somebody spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on uh, textbooks and uh, you know, software packages if I can help it. Uh, but that value I ultimately is lower <laughs> than the priority to get the information across in the most uh, effective means possible. Uh, estimate your credibility. Uh, so this, unfortunately, a lot of times a student doesn't have a lot of credibility uh, with a professor. You know, so that would be something to think about. They would need to go uh, you know, an extra step or two to really, uh, you know, compensate for this lowered credit. I mean, basically the idea is if, <laughs> you know, if you're in the class, you're there to learn from me, uh, not vice versa. You know, that's, that's kind of the default attitude. And so what you would need to do is show, well, that might be true, but, you know, I've done some, done some research on this. I put some thought into this. Uh, I do have some good ideas and you need to take this uh, seriously. Uh, anticipating reactions. Again, something that wasn't done in that email. They didn't either didn't care or probably just didn't really think about how that uh, email. I mean, the student said that the uh, they didn't want to quote waste their money unquote uh, on this <laughs> absurdly uh, priced uh, software. Uh, so something like like that. Uh, so what 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 was my reaction? That really kind of upset me to see that uh, somebody thinks that. I'm just there to waste people's money uh, that I haven't put thought uh, into the, my selections for this, that I didn't have a, <laughs> a good justification for it, uh, or that maybe the whole class they, was a waste. You know, who knows? But that just really was offensive. And I'm sure that's not what the student wanted to do. Uh, but just a few seconds of thought, thinking about how I would have uh, been likely to anticipate or what my reactions would have been, would have probably have changed the whole message. And then, uh, yeah, keeping the secondary audience's mind in mind as well. Uh, so I would never do this personally, but you know, I could imagine somebody being upset enough to sh start showing this to other people and say, "Hey, look at what this person wrote." Uh, or if you know, maybe you're writing something to uh, the clients, but it might get back to a manager. You know, there's all other people that might be looking at this. Uh, you know, sometimes in academic circles, we might be writing something for other English professors, uh, but for whatever reason, it might come to the attention of a, you know, maybe a dean or a, a somebody from another department. And it can be kind of embarrassing sometimes if you haven't really thought about how other people might view uh, what it is you're saying. 
Uh, so anyway, let's just stop here for a minute again and I come back to that office clip and look at these items here on this slide and think about how well Michael uh, followed or did not follow uh, these steps of audience analysis. All right, so let's talk about how to identify reader benefits and constraints. And they say this is the single most important planning step most of the time. So what are we looking at? And we want to find some way uh, to show that the reader, show the reader, uh, this is something that's valuable to them, right? There's something here for them. And it's also something by constraints, they mean it's something that they can actually do something about as opposed to something they have no power over. Uh, yeah, you might have a, a strong value, it'd be great, but if you feel like there's nothing I can do about that, you know, in my position, uh, then you probably just ignore the message. It won't be very persuasive. You feel like it really doesn't apply to me. Uh, so we have values as a reader or as an audience. Any audience will have values, right? These are uh, enduring beliefs and ideals. So if you think about a, what a professor might value, they probably would uh, value uh, education, uh, hard work, uh, good communication skills, good uh, the importance of uh, gathering data and so on. Uh, that's the, those are things that aren't likely to change overnight. Uh, versus the priorities, uh, which this could vary right from class to class. Uh, you know, in some classes you might uh, have a high priority uh, project that's a big writing project, and uh, the professor might say, for this time I'm really going to um, emphasize sources. <laughs> so, I need to see 20 sources in this paper uh, for this project. Uh, but next time it might be uh, the sources aren't a big deal anymore. Now it's uh, maybe they're really focused on the uh, the organization of the paper, you know, let's say. Uh, but this is also would be true of any kind of business situation. You know, what's going on at the time? Uh, what are the What's the current goal of this project? What are the tasks? And so on. Another step is estimating your credibility. Uh, so we're thinking about what the readers will think of us. Uh, how are they likely to be disposed towards us? Do they even know who we are? Uh, do they feel like we're um, experts on the topic? Do they feel like we can be trusted? Uh, that all comes into credibility, what we call ethos. And they say, well, judge these recommendations, requests, or other messages based on that view. Uh, so. If, you know, as a professor, I know I have some students who really strike me as being very serious minded. Uh, I know they, they work hard, <laughs> they do their homework. <laughs> uh, they, they really just strike me as people that are going places and, and take the class and everything. They're very respectful. I mean, all this basically to say that I really have a, uh, I really think that these people are really credible. And so they come to me with a request, uh, let's say that they, uh, I want me to adjust a deadline for an assignment. Well, I'll take that a lot more seriously because I know this person's not just uh, messing around. Uh, they're not just trying to, uh, you know, get some uh, <laughs> get some time off so they can go party. You know, and I don't have that thought at all. Uh, so it'll make me really look twice, really take that recommendation seriously. And that's exactly what they're talking about here with the entry level professionals. Uh, so somebody that's new, they're unproven. Nobody really knows them yet. Uh, so they really have to, they kind of have this low credibility, uh, which is why they have to work so hard uh, to build this. It'll happen over time, <laughs> assuming that you, know, that you do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Uh, but anything you could do uh, around that uh, to boost this early, the better. You, know, you could think of even like getting the raise, you know, the classic uh, rhetorical situation where you're, you want a promotion. Uh, obviously, the more credible you are, <laughs> the more likely you are to get that. Uh, so here's some tips for how to gain credibility. Uh, setting up the time to talk with the boss. In other words, getting to know this, know your manager, know your supervisor. Uh, it's really nice when they know you by name, know your face. Uh, that can That's really important. This, by the way, is the reason why uh, you'll see that if you work a job, it, it, there's a night shift and a day shift. The people on the day shifts typically get promoted faster because they're there when all the bosses and managers are there, or at least the important ones, right? And so they get to know them a lot better. They get more credibility, and they're able to uh, get promoted quickly, uh, whereas somebody on the night shift or a swing shift, maybe they're there when the bosses aren't there, uh, so they don't have these uh, opportunities. 
Now, the second one, asking the boss if you can take on a higher responsibility project. Right? So you hear about some project they're working on, volunteering for that, saying, look, I have some expertise in this area. Uh, that can really show you've got some initiative. Uh, making sure you fit in with that corporate culture. We talked about everything from the professional dress, uh, the communication style. Uh, so everybody there in the office is very formal, <laughs> very serious, <laughs> and you're going around uh, you know, cracking jokes all the time or saying like, hey, man, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> you know, being kind of uh, informal. Uh, that could actually affect your credibility. Uh, but, you know, the opposite could be true as well. You know, if you're at a uh, place like Google or uh, you know, a lot of these places you read about where there is a more of an informal style, a lot more laid back, and you're the person that's in a suit and tie and being too formal, you might actually <laughs> have lower credibility you know, at that particular site. Uh, attending a lot of meetings uh, to get to know as many colleagues as possible. Uh, so this is another good point. Uh, a lot of new people at a job will say, do I have to go to that meeting? Uh, is that meeting required? And if it is, they'll say, well, I'm not going to go then. Uh, I'd rather just stay at home. <laughs> I've got other work to do, <laughs> so I'm not going to go. Uh, but that's not really a good idea because, again, these meetings are probably the most likely places where you'll get to interact with bosses and managers and colleagues you don't see all the time. And that's a, a big step towards building the credibility. And then finally, this idea of a professional blog about the niche area. Uh, so I had some experience with this one. Uh, I kept a blog as a graduate student about uh, technology and education. Uh, just kind of a way to keep myself uh, doing research and looking into new things. But anyway, I kind of got this reputation because I, <laughs> I kind of fell in love with wikis. <laughs> so I was always writing about wikis, Wikipedia, and stuff like that. And this was back before people even knew what a wiki was. Or they thought Wikipedia, you know, I had to explain to them what Wikipedia was and how it worked. And so I kind of got this reputation among my uh, fellow grad students and eventually my colleagues at conferences and things as being a wiki man. <laughs> so they, they called me the wiki man. Uh, and that actually led to a pretty lucrative uh, opportunity. And one of the textbook publishers just so happened to be looking into maybe figuring out a way to use wikis as part of their uh, course management type stuff. Uh, you know, is there any potential here uh, for textbook publishers in this in this wiki space? <laughs> so somebody was telling them about me. Uh, so they got in touch with me just based on this blog, and I got paid a couple thousand dollars to uh, write a white paper. It basically just sort of uh, my own thoughts about the potential of wikis in, in education. Uh, so that's just, I, I kind of like this uh, last point here. It's not something you'd see in every textbook, uh, but that is something that I know from experience uh, can help you gain credibility. So really think about it. All right, so how do you develop uh, a great business idea? Yeah. We just talked about wikis, right? So <laughs> maybe your idea is something about uh, we could use wikis in education. You know, maybe that's the idea you have. How do you develop that, though? It's very sort of beginning, budding idea. You want to kind of figure out a way you can develop this, expand it out, uh, sort it out. Uh, so we want to sort out the business issues and the objectives, get thinking about what's going to be valuable to the business and not just what's uh, valuable to me personally. Uh, collecting as many relevant facts as possible and then making judgments about those facts. What do the facts really mean? You know, you, we can agree on the facts, but we probably <laughs> won't always agree on what the facts mean or what they uh, imply. So here's another nice uh, diagram of this. So identifying the business problem, I would also say opportunities, <laughs> analyzing that uh, business problem or opportunity, and then clarifying the objectives. In other words, what is the objective of this message? Why am I reading this? What, what, what's the purpose? So let's look at some of the differences here, uh, some of the terminology, rather. Uh, so what is a fact? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that's kind of controversial these days. But uh, for, for our purposes, when we say fact, it just means some kind of statement that can be relied on with a fair amount of certainty and can be observed objectively. And so it's not an opinion, right? <laughs> it's not, something you've collected some data on. You've got some hard evidence uh, to back this up. That's considered a fact. Now, what the fact means 
you know, the conclusions, uh, the statements you can reason or deduce from those facts might be completely, uh, we could argue about that. We have to make a case for how the conclusion or how you are able to conclude something based on that particular set of facts. Uh, so the been lots, of, I, you know, I could give you en endless examples of where uh, the data, uh, the data collected for something was shown not really, where the conclusions drawn from data uh, didn't fit. Uh, there's multiple in interpretations of uh, those facts. Uh, you can even look at, uh, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head, but <laughs> you know, maybe you've done some, I had some students that it seemed like whenever I do student projects for business classes, they uh, they want to write about parking. Uh, so they'll collect data, you know, how many students or how many empty parking spots are at this particular lot on given days and, and so on. Uh, so they might say, you know, if, if the facts, if I can look at the data and say, well, you, you know, this data was collected, say, at five o'clock, <laughs> not during peak time or uh, you collected this data during a holiday when most people are gone. Uh, you can't really make good conclusions based on those facts. Uh, yes, there's uh, maybe a lot more parking available <laughs> during spring break, um, that, but you can't really draw from that that uh, we don't need to build a new parking facility. And that's just kind of a silly example, but hopefully you're starting to get the idea here. Uh, positions are the stances you take based on a set of the conclusions. So you might have multiple positions from different people. Right? So some people might uh, be set up to uh, argue against you. you know, they might have a contrary position. Uh, same set of facts, uh, but you're drawing different uh, conclusions and then you're also taking different stances based on those conclusions. Okay, so framing the primary message. So this is, I think, where we really want to slow down and, and uh, you know, zero in, because I think this is where some of the real value of this chapter comes in, uh, structuring the message. Again, something a lot of people are not good at. They just ramble something out. <laughs> they just blurt, blurt it out uh, with very little thought about the structure. And this is something that can only happen if you spend a lot of time planning and then reviewing. But first, you just want to ask yourself, what is the primary message? What is the what, what am I trying to get across here? You know, even just that simple question, you'd be surprised how this can help you write a more effective message to honestly ask this. And then what's a simple, vivid statement in 15 words or less that captures the essence of your message? And, and when I'm talking to students about writing a thesis, for example, we talk about this, uh, the elevator pitch. I think we might have talked about that uh, before, too. Uh, but the idea here is if you can't state what it is in 15 words or less, it probably means you haven't really thought enough about what it is you're trying to say. Uh, that the more you think about it, the more comfortable you are uh, with this, with the, the meaning of this message, uh, the better able you are to be concise about it. And you're not going to be able to say everything in 15 words, obviously, uh, but just being able to articulate it in such a concise way does uh, show that you've uh, given proper thought to how to frame message. Now the logic of the message. Uh, so remember we're not just stating a fact here. We've got uh, conclusions that we want to draw and then we want to establish a position. Uh, so what are the supporting points? Uh, and this of course will depend on what it is you're uh, trying to get across, right? But uh, hopefully you have some evidence to back up your point. Uh, what do you want to explicitly ask the readers to do? The call to action. So again, something that tends to get neglected sometimes. You know, I get emails from students all the time where I'm not really sure even what wh what do they want me to do? <laughs> and they're not really asking me anything. And I tell students too in my 332 class when they write their uh, application letters, you know, make sure you tell them in there somewhere that uh, you would like them to uh, call you and uh, set up an interview. Uh, you want the job. <laughs> <laughs> don't just leave a, an important point like that hanging. Uh, you know, a lot of these uh, job application letters I look at, it sounds more like they're just asking for information about the job. They're not making it explicit that they want to be interviewed. So that's what they mean there by the call to action. What, what, what action are you calling for? And then how do you order this all this logic? 
Basically, how do you organize the document? And they say here that business arguments employ a direct or deductive approach. You know, so they don't mess around, they get to the point quickly. So they even begin by stating that primary message we talked about. And then they'll lay out supporting reasons after this and then uh, wrap up with a call to action. Uh, let's, let's see what else we have here. In some cases, uh, such as delivering bad news, an indirect or inductive approach is helpful. Uh, so I was uh, teaching another class, English 300 with uh, Sharon Cognell, and she was talking about how the Declaration of Independence actually fits this model. Uh, so it doesn't start off by saying we need to revolt. <laughs> we need to revolt from, from England. You know, that is not the first sentence. <laughs> Uh, they don't uh, think it's Madison or Jefferson. Uh, anyway, the author of that doesn't get around to the call to action or the actual, uh, you know, the, the call to a revolt to the very end. Because it is <laughs> pretty bad news <laughs> uh, that they want to uh, revolt. So they kind of save that uh, point to the end. Uh, but normally, though, it'd be the opposite, right? What, what do you want the person to do? Uh, what is the primary message? Now, uh, this approach provides supporting reasons first, uh, followed by the primary message. Oh, again, that's just talking about this uh, other one. In the Declaration of Independence, if you read it, you will see that it begins with all these things that the king has done. You know, the king has uh, been putting uh, soldiers in people's houses. Uh, the king has been raising taxes without our consent. You know, so it goes on and on like this with all these reasons before it announces that they uh, want to uh, declare independence. Does it come to the end? Uh, but again, this is only in special cases of uh, bad news. Uh, so here's a, a really nice flow chart, and I highly encourage you to make a chart like this uh, when you start to work on your uh, your projects for this course or any kind of business document. So you got your primary message. That's the position you're taking with a recommendation. You, know, you can think again about a resume or a job application. The recommendation is they hire you, right? <laughs> You'd be a good fit uh, for this job. They should call you in for an interview. Okay, then we're going to have uh, key points. And I always like the idea of having at least uh, three. If you have three key points or three, your strongest reasons, your, your strongest evidence as to why you're a good fit, uh, you can think, you can organize the entire document along those lines. Very strong, stable structure. Uh, it's just, it's just, uh, <laughs> I, did, I love this. Uh, so you got the primary message, three key points, and each of these key points has their own uh, evidence. And this would help you too, if you made a chart like this and you filled it out, it would help you to, to arrange it, right? So you might be able to figure out, well, what should I do first? Or what should be point number two? Uh, you could make that decision based on how much evidence or how strong the evidence is for these various key points. Uh, now, again, the important thing, though, is all of this comes back together at the end to this call to action. So the <laughs> what now? <laughs> so you recommend that they call you for the interview. You've got some really good points. you got some evidence to support those points. But don't forget <laughs> to, uh, to mention, yes, uh, call me at the number to... Uh, come in to do the interview. And that's true for any kind of business document, whether it's that job application or the wellness plan that they're talking about in this book, new parking facility, whatever it is, you want to make it clear. And so this is the typical paragraph organization in a deductive business message and then the various components. So the primary message is the topic sentence there. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, what's this other one over here? Yeah, that goes in the opening paragraph, obviously. Primary message as the topic sentence. Uh, the key point one is the topic sentence. Key point two. So, that, you know, if this does this look familiar to you? <laughs> opening body conclusion. I mean, <laughs> uh, this looks suspiciously like a, a little thing they call the five paragraph essay. Uh, that you might be familiar with from high school. And I, I think it's funny how it seems like that five paragraph essay has a bad rep these days and a lot of teachers uh, will tell you not to use it. Uh, but I've always uh, liked it, I always teach it uh, to my students because again, we see it here. This isn't, you know, this, this isn't like a ivy, ivory tower business or ivory tower stuff here. I mean, this is uh, actual business research has shown. <laughs> you know, this is the best way to set up uh, these business messages. and. 
you know, to me, that's a good reason to teach the five paragraph essay. You know, get people familiar with this structure because uh, lo and behold, here it is. Here it's showing up. Uh, you know, with some of the most important documents you'll ever write, but <laughs> you do leave the university. <laughs> and so, right, here we got another one of my favorite talk, topics, which is logical inconsistencies. And again, this is a really good reason to take as many critical thinking, really as many uh, philosophy classes as, as you can get into, because uh, they'll really uh, do a lot more with this than we will here. Uh, I will mention a podcast I really uh, love called Skeptoid, S-K-E-P-T-O-I-D. -E -E <laughs> you can find it on uh, iTunes and apps, whatever podcast sites uh, uh, you listen to. And it's Brian Dunning. And what he does on every podcast is take a topic uh, like Bigfoot or some kind of a pseudoscience, uh, you know, everything from um, some kind of brainwave uh, or what's the thing with the, the, the contrails in the sky, <laughs> or fluoride in the water, uh, whatever people are kind of arguing about, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about, uh, he'll tackle those topics, and you'll apply each one of these uh, logical inconsistencies to it, see what the evidence is, uh, see if the evidence is good, whether it holds up, uh, whether it can be easily refuted. Uh, he just does this over and over with so many different topics. It's a really good exercise uh, to listen to that. And uh, it kind of teaches you how to think critically, basically. Uh, let's look at some of these. Uh, the unsupported generalization. <clears throat> so you gotta, you're making a generalization like, uh, uh, well, uh, these, these ancient remedies are better uh, than modern medicine. Uh, but you don't really provide any substantial claims to back that up. And this is probably the most common one. Uh, on a resume, you'd say, or a job letter, somebody might say, I'm a really great communicator, or I'm a, a, I'm a great collaborator. So, but they'll just say it. <laughs> they just put it. <laughs> uh, they don't give you any evidence to back it up. And so that's what I call an unsupported generalization, very common. Uh, the faulty cause and effect claim, kind of similar to this. Uh, the classic example of this is, uh, I washed my car, so therefore it rained. <laughs> uh, this rain was caused by me by washing the car. You know, something like that just doesn't. That's kind of a silly example, but you'll see these seriously all the time. Uh, somebody will link, say something is that effect is caused by something. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe it has nothing to do with that. Uh, weak analogies. We say learning is just <laughs> teaching and learning is just like uh, oh, I don't know riding a bicycle. Our memory is just like riding a bicycle. And try to say that you know years later you can if you haven't even ridden a bicycle you still remember how to ride that bicycle years later and uh, composition is just like that <laughs> that doesn't really hold up does it <laughs> uh so that's just a silly one off the top of my head i'm sure you can think of many more uh, the either or logic is another one that comes up all the time you know so either we buy this particular product or our company will fail and never mind all the other products we could purchase instead. Uh, you know, either we do this or this is going to happen. Or there's only two choices when really there's a multitude of choices. <laughs> Just trying to use this faulty logic. Uh, slanting the facts kind of goes without, you know, I don't really need to describe this one. Uh, you can see how in this in the news all the time, if you look at uh, the same scenario, the same story, now look at it in two different papers. You know, look at the way uh, the New York Times or CNN uh, reports the story, and then maybe flip over to Fox News uh, and look at the way they report the same story. Now you'll see maybe the same facts, but they won't be <laughs> presented the same way. There will be a different slant uh, between those uh, sources. Not all the time, but I think you'll <laughs> it won't take you long to see that. Uh, and then finally, exaggeration. And again, you know what that means, right? Just uh, trying to extract too big of a claim out of something. You know, oh my goodness, if we don't add a new parking facility on campus, the, <laughs> the university will be forced to close. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably not going to happen. Uh, so anyway, let's think about these logical inconsistencies again uh, in the context of that office clip. Uh, which ones, one or ones, was Michael guilty of? Now let's talk uh, briefly here about the tone of a message. 
And and when we say the tone, somebody might think about it this way: if I, if somebody tells you I don't really like the tone, your tone, <laughs> what do they mean uh, when they say that? I don't like your tone. It's not saying they don't. It's not saying they don't like your information, right? Or they think you're incorrect about the facts. It's something different than that, right? It's something kind of uh, almost intangible, you know, if you think about that. Uh, but they describe it here as the what the reader perceives or how the the overall evaluation the reader perceives the writer to have toward the reader and the message content. Uh, so towards the reader, uh, so I might you might if you say I don't like your tone, it probably means you feel like this person's being disrespectful to you, or they're being hostile. Uh, to you or overly aggressive uh, or it could be they sound apathetic you know, like this is something that they should be taking very seriously uh, but instead it seems like they uh, uh, don't care you, know, you see this sometimes uh, when somebody's grieving and somebody uh, is talking to them about it but they don't sound like they really care <laughs> and they seem insensitive uh, about this person's grief and so that would be another problem uh, with tone. Uh, sometimes it's intentional. More than likely, it's uh, unintentional, though. It's something you need to be more mindful of. And so the attitude towards the person, uh, uh, but also the content, you know, the, whatever the subject uh, discussion is, <laughs> what's their tone toward that? So they want to be perfectly respectful uh, to the to the reader, uh, but they're not. They're showing kind of apathy towards the the subject. Uh, maybe they sound like uh, they're not taking it seriously. Uh, so there's some principles for setting the right tone. Uh, one, demonstrating positivity. Uh, you know, I think I mentioned this several times at this point, but the, the less complaining you can get, <laughs> you can do the better. <laughs> Usually, complaining about something just makes uh, uh, the communication harder. Doesn't really do much good. You know, especially if there's nothing the <laughs> reader can do about it. I mean, how many times have you seen? Uh, somebody uh, behind a desk and there's somebody <laughs> not customer service uh, somebody's are yelling at the customer service person uh, they're being very negative they're complaining about everything under the sun uh, the person can't do a, a damn thing about it <laughs> so, and nothing's getting done there it's just a complete waste of everybody's time uh, so imagine how different it would be if everybody would just practice these uh, first two principles right demonstrate positivity so they're not just there to complain and be negative, uh, but there's something there. There's some reason to get uh, enthused or excited about this. Uh, there's a positive uh, <clears throat> spin. And then sure, I think the second one's more important, really. The, the concern for the others, right? Uh, so you're not just letting your, your own uh, emotions uh, get hijacked there. Uh, but you're thinking about these other people. How do they feel? You know, this person that's on the other end of this, uh, uh, the person being shouted at. You know, my guess is the person the shouting at them is not even, they have no inkling. Uh, they're not showing concern for that other person at all. And that's probably not going to go over very well, no matter how professional that <laughs> the unfortunate person is in that situation. All right, so how can you make your message more positive? Uh, the can-do attitude, confident attitude. Uh, this can be easier to say than do. A lot of times... Uh, uh, and I've heard other professors tell me this. Uh, they will write a message the first time, just honestly how they feel about it. <laughs> then they will promptly, uh, promptly delete that message, not send it. And then they'll write uh, another message uh, trying to embrace more of this can-do uh, confident attitude. So your first impulse might just be to complain, to insult the person, to be disrespectful, uh, or to show... Uh, you know, to give up, to sound like you're giving up, or that you're <laughs> uh, you're not you're hopeless. You think the situation is hopeless. That might be your first impulse. Uh, so again, follow, maybe follow their advice. Write it out how you feel the first time, delete it, and then revi uh, re rewrite it with this can-do attitude. So something uh, that can be done about it, rather than just uh, the negative stuff. Uh, focus on the positive uh, rather than the negative traits of the products and the services uh, and this can be really annoying even with d2l and everybody likes to bash d2l and there's another one called curriculum navigator <laughs> people uh, that yet yeah, it has some problems uh, but you don't necessarily need to fixate on those negative traits because i mean the truth is it does a lot more right 
or it helps a lot more than it hurts. You know, people can uh, get a skewed view sometimes just by focusing so much on the negative, uh, they forget about the positive things, the reason they have this product in the first place. Uh, using diplomatic, constructive terms related to the relationships uh, and the interactions, right, because this is really what's at stake in some of these exchanges, right? You've got a relationship uh, to this audience. You know, if you're a student, you have a relationship uh, to the professor. If you're an employee, you have this relationship to the boss or the manager, uh, to your colleagues. And you really always want to have that relationship in mind. Yes, it might feel good to vent and rant and complain, but, uh, but if you're being uh, perceived as disrespectful, losing credibility, damaging relationships, uh, maybe burning bridges sometimes uh, with, with these uh, uh, with these uh, messages, uh, you really want to put, <laughs> not do that unless it's just absolutely necessary. All right, so how, how do you show uh, concern for others? Well, simple. Uh, best advice not to think too much about uh, yourself so the I voice everything me 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 everything you know this is inconvenient to me this is a problem for me this is affecting my work it's just everything is from your point of view you're not thinking at all about the, the person you're talking to uh, respecting the time and the autonomy uh, of the readers so you're not telling them what to think uh, you're not telling them get back to me ASAP you know, as if they have nothing better to do with, <laughs> with their time. Uh, you, if you, it's possible you're booking an appointment and you have a reason <laughs> for the appointment. <laughs> All those things show you respect the person's time or just simply thanking them uh, for taking the time, not taking that time for granted. Uh, giving credit to others, huge thing. Uh, so many times, if you really want to know a good leader, uh, watch any leader, a speech they're giving, and you'll notice that, assuming this leader is effective at all, usually they will open with this. You know, the first words out of their mouth will be, first, you know, I would like to give credit uh, to everybody that made this possible, or yada, yada. They might go on for the majority of the speech just giving all this credit uh, to other people. Uh, they don't make it about me, 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 and, and I, look how wonderful I am. Uh, that's a minimal uh, part of that message. And then we have meta messages. So this is the kind of the message about the message, right? The <laughs> meta level stuff going on. Uh, the underlying messages people take away. So what you might think of is reading between the lines, uh, encoded, decoded, combinations, content, tone, uh, other signals. So things that you don't necessarily explicitly say, but nevertheless, they're, they're there as part of this uh, meta message. And it could be really tough, obviously, to get a handle on this. It might not, you know, by definition, it's not something that's necessarily apparent. Uh, you might have to read it two or three times to start to start picking up on basically what it is I'm not saying. Uh, let's see what they have here. Uh, mixed signals occur when the content of a message conflicts with the tone, uh, the nonverbal communication, other signals. Uh, sending the mixed signal not only confusing, but also frequently results in negative uh, meta messages and you know it does come back to tone and, and things of this sort right uh, if you want to uh, if your tone is conciliatory <laughs> you're trying to apologize about something let's say and uh, maybe the tone is good but then you look at the nonverbal communication and maybe the person's smiling or they seem uh, you know their face isn't really matching the uh, what you'd expect to see on a <laughs> sad uh, person or other signals right maybe they say well I really value uh, our time together, but at the same time, they're constantly looking up at the clock, <laughs> checking their watch, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Uh, mixed messages. Yeah, so they didn't just come out and say anything, uh, but there's still a clash uh, with these uh, other factors. All right. Whew. I feel like I tried to uh, speed things up here. Hopefully that wasn't too quick. Uh, what we tried to do in this chapter, uh, get across the idea of the goals, how important it is to have goals uh, for effective business messages and what those goals are and should be. Uh, we talked about the aim, planning process, which again is the, the audience, uh, the uh, information, and then the message uh, development. Uh, so audience needs, business ideas, the key points you want to get across. And then the importance of uh, striking the right tone. You know, obviously it's got positive tones here. That's the should be your defaults. Uh, but sometimes you don't want to seem positive, obviously, in terms of uh, bad news. And there's some. We'll talk. I'm sure more about the uh, 
you know, the negative messages and how to handle that later on. Uh, the, really, the goal here is to make sure the tone is appropriate for the message in question. Anyway, we've kind of covered a lot here. Um, if you do have uh, questions, comments, stories you'd like to share, I would love to read those. Please take a few minutes to do that, and I'll see you next time.